Good afternoon, North Dakota, and welcome to this afternoon's press briefing. Today, North Dakota Department of Health confirmed 42 additional cases of the novel coronavirus disease, or COVID-19, out of 1,813 tests. Uh, dividing the 42 positives by the 1813, that gets you to the 2.3% daily rate. Uh, this is down from 3.8% uh, over the past two days, and it's been our lowest single day positive rate since April 10th, which is great news because we want to see that positive rate trending down. It also lowers our cumulative since the very beginning, since the first case on March 11th, cumulative uh, of the over 25,000 tests we've taken and 1,000 positive, that's a 4% positive rate. And uh, again, we are, in terms of testing, uh, with these tests at 20, over 25,000 tests, breaking that threshold, North Dakota remains sixth in the nation out of the 50 states in Washington, the capital of Washington, D.C., so sixth out of 51. Uh, and again, we continue to ramp up our testing uh, capability, but this is important, the amount of testing we're doing, because as I've said before, it's our gas pedal and our steering wheel as it guides us through these uncharted waters. If we go to the net case breakdown on the next slide, uh, our total active confirmed are, are now at 577, uh, and we've got 437 individuals uh, that have recovered, uh, and sadly, uh, 19 deaths. Uh, but in, again, in contrast, because we, our hearts go out to anyone who's lost someone uh, during this time, uh, who's passed away uh, as one of the complicating factors being COVID. Uh, in contrast, uh, we extend our hearts out to our neighbor to the east in Minnesota who had 18 deaths today in the state. We've only had 19 during the whole, the whole journey. And of course, their population is about seven and a half times larger than uh, North Dakota, uh, but they're uh, at a much higher uh, death rate than North Dakota. They're at 319 total deaths right next door in Minnesota. So again, it helps remind us uh, that this disease, uh, it's not just something that's you know happening in New York or, uh, or Italy or China. It can happen right next door. And again, thank you to all the North Dakotans who are uh, doing great things to protect themselves and their loved ones. Uh, we... Uh, when we take a look at the uh, the current hospitalized, we're at 28. That's a new record as well. But again, this uh, approximates between one and two percent of the total healthcare capacity that's available, even in our current. That's before we get into any kind of surge capacity. Uh, and so again, super low utilization among the lowest in the nation at any point in time during this in terms of the amount of people that we've, uh, beds that have had to be dedicated towards hospitalization. So that's uh, great. And again, uh, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're, you know, very confident about our the, the cumulative average response rate that we talked about uh, because of the, uh, the high testing that we're doing and that 4% cumulative rate that we described on the previous slide, that's, there's only four states that have a lower cumulative completed test rate than North Dakota. So this has been a great place to be during uh, the pandemic. And of course, going forward as we uh, move towards uh, getting our economy going again. Uh, we're confident in the ability of North Dakota and our healthcare providers to serve and care for all of our citizens. If we take a look at the, the, the case trends slide, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, again above the line in the turquoise uh, are the cases that are positive uh, and then the little light on the top of that is the new cases added on top of that. And so again, we saw that we had those 42 new cases uh, today. Uh, but again, as we th we reporting these on a statewide basis, 36 out of those 42 new cases today came from uh, a combination of Cass and Grand Forks County. Uh, we also had another nice day today, too, in terms of recovered, 28 people recovered. And so that's why you see the net increase, which went down yesterday by 10, up 14 today. So only four higher than we were a couple days ago. So bouncing around, uh, too early to tell whether that's going to be the top of the uh, active list or not right now. But we expect that we should see you know, more recoveries uh, in, the, in the days ahead. When we take a look at our continued uh, 
you know, decline in the positive rate, the 14-day cumulative rate on the next slide. Uh, we see again here that uh, we're beginning to see a sustained decline. That, you know, this is a pretty flat curve because we never had the steep up, up take, as you can see. You know, we've, uh, this is the, just the testing percentage for the last 14 days. Uh, we, other states that really got into a surge condition, uh, New York was in the, New Jersey were in the mid 40% of tests taken were positive. Uh, other states, uh, uh, Georgia and Michigan were in the 20 plus percent rate. So again, we're uh, heading down in the right direction, but our, our curve was uh, always quite flat because of, again, the great work that North Dakotans did to protect themselves uh, and their their loved ones. Uh, this is the lowest we've been at uh, now. We're at 5.8%. It's the lowest uh, since we were back at 5.6 on April 20th, and it's down an, a half a percentage point, 6.3, uh, where it was hovering uh, for a portion of last week. Uh, we want Each day we show some different county slides. Today we're showing a rate of testing by county. This is the number of tests conducted per 1,000 individuals in the county. So statewide on an average, it's 33 and a half. Uh, tests per individual. You can see that in where we did some of the very early on in a very in our one of our lowest populated counties, Slope County. It's in the dark green in the far southwest portion of the slide. That's the highest we have. We're uh, a a 170 plus out of a thousand. There's not even a thousand people that live in. Uh, Slope County, uh, but a lot of testing uh, per per population there. And again, you can see in areas where we have had outbreaks and done concentrated testing, we've done more testing in Grand Forks uh, in neighboring counties there around there uh, as part of the, the rapid response testing we've done there in response to that. Also the same at Montreal and others. And again, we're, you'll see the testing uh, areas go dark because we're delivering testing capacity to places where we were observing outbreaks or potential outbreaks. On the uh, next slide, we want to get topic. We want to jump into uh, North Dakota Smart Restart again, which we talked about in detail yesterday. Uh, we released these guidelines, which is a roadmap to getting our economy going, a better, safer, healthier North Dakota for employees, empl employers, and customers alike. Uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford likes to call this COVID etiquette, and I think that's a great way to think about this because this is uh, part of that, the new approach that we're going to have to take to make sure that well, we still uh, have, we have new tools and new capabilities to manage uh, the, the virus and the pandemic, uh, it's not going away and it still represents a threat to uh, individuals, especially those most vulnerable, but it also can represent a threat to businesses as we've seen, whether you're in other states, food processing plants or in our own state where if uh, businesses have to shut down uh, because they have an outbreak, it represents a threat that way. And again, as we move towards uh, releasing uh, restrictions, uh, the light touch that we've had on the 7% of jobs in North Dakota, uh, again, reminding people that all of all of healthcare, all of agriculture, all of energy, all of construction, all of government, and all of education remained open. Uh, but for those uh, that were, were opening up, we're part of the North Dakota Smart Restart, there's guidelines uh, for those industries. Uh, but we're also putting out uh, these, which are the North Dakota Smart Restart include standards for all industries, not just those that were covered under the executive order. So even if you're open this whole time, uh, or if you mandatorily closed and you weren't under any executive orders, if, as you think about reopening, uh, please check out the North Dakota Smart uh, <clears throat> guidelines. They're available on ndresponse.gov and then click down till you find the North Dakota Smart restart. Uh, we are uh, one, uh, uh, we're implementing a, the new standards in a new executive order. There were some questions about this yesterday. And on that new executive order, which we're pulling up next, is the on 2020-06.4, uh, meaning it's had revisions. Uh, these are the guidelines for businesses that are resuming operation or continuing to operate. Uh, and this requires that certain businesses sectors follow industry-specific standards. Uh, reminder that all reopenings are voluntary. Uh, yesterday when we had Michelle Comer here, uh, she talked about specific guidelines that were separate for massage therapists versus uh, 
other personal care businesses versus bars versus restaurants. Uh, all of those guidelines are out there. In this executive order, it refers that businesses that, that were closed as they reopen, they must uh, follow those uh, new standards. And there was a question yesterday uh, about violations. And again, I want to be clear on that. Violations of the order would be considered an infraction. Uh, that's not a misdemeanor. It's an infraction subject to a $1,000 fine. And the uh, uh, local county or state law enforcement, whoever is appropriate, would be the ones enforcing that. But again, we're not, we're focused as we were before on the on the 98, 99% of North Dakotans who did a fantastic job of voluntarily complying uh, to help protect themselves and those around them. And again, uh, we expect that there will be high compliance because again, high reliance on individual responsibility here in our state is part of the whole North Dakota SMART approach. Uh, but to clarify also, because there was questions yesterday, the state health officer under the authority uh, that's invested in that office will work with local public health boards and implement measures that are necessary to spread uh, communicable diseases and those orders, which could be uh, quarantine orders or isolation orders, those orders from the state health officer, uh, different from the executive orders we're talking about here, those orders do carry the force of law and uh, are often misdemeanors. So again, both infractions for executive orders, misdemeanors for state health officer orders, enforcement always local, uh, but the main emphasis here is on the uh, great voluntary uh, responsibility, individual responsibility we've seen across the state. Uh, the order that we're issuing tomorrow uh, is going to require that recreational and sports arenas, music and entertainment venues remain closed until further notice. We mentioned this yesterday, but again, uh, that would include uh, large concert venues like the Fargo Dome or the Bismarck uh, Civic Center. It would include, when we say sports arenas, we're talking about uh, places where uh, at our college campuses, for example, where there might be uh, sporting events, those are all uh, going to remain closed. Again, we're trying to uh, avoid having the really large gatherings as we dial back up the amount of interaction and potential spread and potential risk uh, to dial that up in a slower way. We'll continue to work with the stakeholders, both public and private of those venues, on guidelines and appropriate timing for reopening uh, as the pandemic continues to unfold. Uh, we've also had a lot of questions about schools and whether schools will continue with distance learning or return to in-person classroom. Uh, as I mentioned last night, we had a long, long discussion last night with Superintendent Baszler uh, and Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford and others. Uh, today we had a discussion with some legislators, getting more input from legislators. Uh, the our office and DPI is also getting input from school administrators, the teachers union uh, and school board members, uh, as well as parents. And we're continuing to work towards guidance that could be released. Uh, the earliest might be uh, Friday of this week. Uh, but for right now, again, the uh, folks should continue to continue uh, working on the distance learning. And let's make that as great as it can be uh, is what we, again, so keep trying to optimize that path for right now. Uh, we'll also, in the meeting last night, uh, not just thinking about the school year because education doesn't stop there. Many of our school districts offer summer programs. Uh, and so we're taking a look at preparing for what summer school might look like. We're also have this new concept called the fall, uh, pre-fall pre opening called an acceleration academy, uh, which uh, could put further distance between us and the, and the, the coronavirus in terms of time, uh, but it would also uh, make sure that students that might have been falling behind have an opportunity to get accelerated heading into the fall year. So hopefully, as we say, through disruption comes innovation. We look forward to continuing to hear all the great ideas from K-12 leaders and teachers and others uh, for how we can safely uh, and appropriately uh, use all of our assets uh, to keep educating our youth. Long-term uh, care update. Uh, as we've talked about before, we've got eight criteria for a North Dakota Smart Restart. We've got checkbox by seven of those. One that we don't uh, relates to protections for the most vulnerable, one of the most important ones. Currently, we've got 27 long-term care facilities out of 218 that have been affected uh, with a total of 130 positive cases. Of those 27 locations, 12 are staff cases only. Four of those are resident cases uh, only. 
And then we've got uh, 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 11 others that are both staff and resident both. Uh, we do have rapid response testing teams uh, that are working collaboratively with long-term care facilities to ensure proper protocols are being followed uh, and that we're getting in and doing testing. When we have the first positive, we try to get in and want to test all the residents and all the staff, and that's, uh, that's going well, and we'll continue to expand that capability. Uh, again, we, we know that there is... Uh, in the news uh, recently uh, in Massachusetts, there was a veterans home, over 70 people passed away in the same veterans home. Uh, this is obviously something that our entire leadership team at the state of North Dakota cares about deeply, that we wanna make sure that we don't have that kind of an outbreak in any one of our congregate living facilities. So when we talk about vulnerable population protection plan or the VP3, uh, we're talking about long-term care, we're talking about skilled, we're talking about basic, we're talking about assisted living, and we're also talking about uh, congregate homes that may be for uh, developmentally disabled, the homeless and others. I mean, these are all would fall under the vulnerable population uh, category. Uh, so here to share an update on the important work that we're doing uh, relative to the Vulnerable Population Protection Plan is Executive Director of the Department of Human Services, Chris Jones. Chris, thanks for being here today. And thanks for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you, Governor. Um, just want to give an update on, on the VP3 plan. You can obviously see that it's one of the eight that is not checked. So we're focused very intently on protecting our most vulnerable. And I just want to highlight what, what the governor previously said. The vulnerable populations include all of those individuals in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities, as well as those in group homes, those with developmental disabilities, as well as those in cor corrections and also those experiencing homeless or, or domestic violence. Since last Tuesday, we've assembled a leadership team that includes Dr. Andrew Stahl, who is um, in the National Guard, but comes to us and has a great wealth of experience, as well as Roseanne Schmidt. Roseanne Schmidt was previously the interim administrator for a nursing home in Beulah and is a uh, retired chief nursing officer from CHI St. Alexis and Jan Camphouse, who is a uh, retired CNO for Sanford Health. Their role is to garner the resources we currently have in the state to address this vulnerable population, as well as add additional resources to continue to build up and make sure that we are protecting our most vulnerable across all of these areas. And I want to stress that we're going to continue to move rapidly. This plan will continue to be enhanced day after day, week after week, and we are going to be pushing aggressively to make decisions as quickly as possible with everybody's interest in mind. So since last Thursday, we've been working closely with the hospitals and the nursing homes specifically as it relates to how will we move patients across the system. As the governor have said multiple times, the capacity of our healthcare system, the acute care side, we have plenty of capacity and, and we're, we're ready for whatever surge comes. But given that, our nursing homes are operating at 74% occupancy, and a lot of that is also predicated on having adequate staff. So what we spent the last three, four days really working through with our partners is how do we have plans that either identify those nursing homes that can effectively quarantine those residents and cohort staff, meaning only have staff working with individuals who are COVID positive, or in cases where that can't be done, what is the transfer protocol? And the transfer protocol is not only with to move patients from a hospital into a congregate housing setting, but also moving individuals from a congregate housing setting back into a hospital or another area. As a side note to that, we're in active negotiations to identify a basic care memory care unit, which would only be for basic care COVID positive residents. I think the important thing that we're trying to address here is that we do not have involuntary transfers or involuntary discharges of residents, meaning not only with this population, but all populations. When an individual is leaving a skilled nursing facility or other congregate housing, we know exactly where they are and they have the protections available to them when they go to that next setting of care. 
and want to thank everybody over the last couple of days. We've had, I will be honest, we've had spirited discussion about how do we best serve this population, not only the COVID positive residents, but also the COVID negative residents. These aren't easy decisions. And this is why it's important that there isn't one, one math problem that we're trying to address. That's the role that Dr. Stahl, Roseanne, and Jan have as it relates to working with the community with the assets, with the resources, developing the partnership, but making a decision very quickly when, when these cases come up. The other thing that the, the governor brought up is the rapid response teams. So we are standing these up right now to allow us to quickly deploy resources. It is being intertwined with the testing strategy that's ongoing specifically within skilled nursing today, but also have a direct line to these clinicians as it relates to um, having access to adequate PPE, um, having ac access to deep cleaning services, whether that's through the National Guard or through contracts that we are negotiating with with cleaning vendors. And finally, as it relates to visitation policies, I, I wanna stress that even though the governor is talking about opening up on Friday, that does not change visitation policies in any way, shape or form. And I would encourage everybody who has a loved one in a congregate housing setting to limit visitation, even if, they're, even if they can go in, please limit your visitation and use other ways to interact with your loved ones in these congregate housing settings. We are going to continue to look at this, but that is the way that we can protect the most vulnerable by limiting visitation. And we understand that's difficult. We know there's a number of congregate housing settings that have set up FaceTime and Skype and wanna make sure that everybody has that. For those out there that don't have access to FaceTime or Skype with their loved ones, please work with that facility that they're in. And if you aren't getting what you need, please let us know and we will assist with that. But the number one way to prevent the spread within these congregate housing settings is to prevent or to limit visitation as much as possible. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about what's going on with the, the homelessness population. Um, as many of you, may not know is we have we do have homeless within the state of North Dakota and we do have shelters but with shelters are congregate settings as well and so they are at a higher risk for contracting COVID just by their by their um, their daily their daily living and also by going into those congregate settings so over the past few weeks in eight communities we've um, set up scattered housing for individuals who are COVID positive or need to be quarantined. And while doing that, we're also able to identify any physical or mental health concerns and have provided nursing supports to manage and monitor COVID symptoms. To date, we have sheltered more than 35 individuals who are COVID positive or needed to be quarantined and will be, continue to be providing more information as this, for this vulnerable population as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to your team, and uh, thanks for sticking around for Q&A afterwards. I uh, also want to uh, give a shout out, too, because uh, uh, he says he's not a big birthday guy, but he's spending his birthday with us, so happy birthday, Chris Jones. Uh, next uh, mail-in ballot topic. Uh, with the virus dominating the news in our daily lives, it's easy for other topics to fall by the wayside and up on the back burner, but one thing we certainly do not want to ignore is one of the most sacred aspects of a democracy, and that's the right to vote. Uh, on March 26th, I signed an executive order enabling uh, physical distancing while voting by suspending the requirement that counties uh, have at least one physical polling location and encourage counties to pursue the vote by mail plans for the June 9th primary. Uh, well, some people may have se seen that that was uh, early to do that over a month ago. Uh, ballots have to be prepared. There's absentee ballots that have to be sent out. And so we had to make a decision early. We didn't know what direction uh, this was gonna be going. We didn't know if we'd be open or closed. Uh, so in order to protect the right to vote, uh, we took that early action. Uh, heading into that, out of North Dakota's 53 counties, there were 33 of our 53 counties uh, and again, those were ones that were more primarily rural or very spread out, where they were already doing their election by uh, mail, and, and, and that was the primary form in 33 counties. Uh, under, that under the prior law, they had to have at least one 
a polling place. Usually that was at the county seat building where a few people might trickle in on the day of the, the, of the vote, but everybody, uh, you didn't have to apply for an absentee ballot. Everybody was voting by mail, and so the vast majority was, was done by mail in those counties, and that's been going on for some time. So we know that voting by mail can work in North Dakota and can work in a way where we can protect the integrity of the vo vote and avoid uh, any kind of voter fraud. We now, we've worked with uh, tribal lands, county and tribal governments, uh, and we've secured support for the vote by mail for all North Dakotans. And this means that in this primary, uh, this is no determination on the fall election, but the primary coming up in June is that for there'll be no polling locations open in the state of North Dakota for primary elections. All ballots will be issued through the mail. So again, well, that may seem like a shocking thing to those of us that are used to perhaps going in and voting. Uh, I want everyone to uh, understand we're now, we're still uh, six, seven weeks away from that election. Uh, there is a ample time for everybody to get their voter by mail uh, ballot uh, and a lot of help to help you make sure you can navigate this process. Starting last Friday, uh, North Dakota Secretary of State's office began mailing applications for vote by mail ballots to every eligible voter in North Dakota. I know that I received my uh, letter earlier this week. Uh, if you don't receive your letter, and it's a letter inviting you to apply for a ballot. So you have to, there's an action you have to take. You're not getting sent a ballot, you're getting sent a application for your vote by mail ballot. So if you don't receive yours by May 11th and we'll make further announcements, uh, please contact your county auditor or visit vote.nd.gov to create and print an application, which you can then send to your county auditor. Once you receive and fill out this application, uh, if you've received yours in the mail, sign it and return it to your county auditor. After you've done that, they will send you the mail-in ballot. Completed ballots must be then uh, returned by mail to your county auditor by June 8th or delivered to the county's secure ballot drop box by 4 p.m. on June 9th. Uh, assistive voting devices will be available to any assistants needing assistance to complete their ballot. Contact your county auditor to make an appointment and learn about any precautions you may need to take. And voting by mail can be quick, easy, and safely done from home. We encourage all eligible North Dakotans to take advantage of this important opportunity that we have as Americans to participate in government. I want to say some thank yous. Uh, first of all, of course, to Secretary of State Al Jager, also to Attorney General Wayne Stengem, all of our county commissioners, the county auditors, tribal leaders, North Dakota Association of Counties, North Dakota County Auditors Association, for their work in helping to ensure that every eligible North Dakotan voter uh, cast, is able to cast a ballot and that we're able to do that while still protecting the health and safety of our voters and even more importantly the poll workers who often the, who volunteered sat there all day came in contact with hundreds of people uh, and they themselves might have fallen into that vulnerable category so again uh, thanks to everybody making this happen and again the executive order we put out uh, allowed, encouraged counties to do this, but again, it was counties that took the action to make sure that everybody has this right to vote and vote safely, so thank you to the counties. Uh, we also wanna give another shout out. One of the things I know people, uh, it's a great to exercise the right of voting, and who doesn't love a sticker? Uh, and when you get to wear your I voted sticker, I mean, that's a cool thing. Uh, we had a contest this year, and I wanna say thank you and congratulations to Chloe Brandon of Trail County. Uh, Chloe. Uh, was a, is a fourth grader, designed our next I Voted sticker, and Chloe's design, which you can see on the screen and right here, was selected from hundreds of entries and will be used during North Dakota's 2020 election uh, and beyond. Uh, and so many auditors are planning to include the sticker in the mailed ballots. So if you get sent a sticker, don't put it on until you've completed your ballot and sent it back in again. Uh, and when you've done that, then you can wear, you've earned the right to wear the I Voted sticker designed by Chloe. Uh, congratulations, Chloe, and also thank you to the hundreds of other students, uh, all those budding designers who submitted design. We appreciate that, appreciate you, and appreciate you supporting uh, the great act of voting. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, we're gonna do uh, unemployment numbers. Straightforward, you get to hear these every day. Regular claims, 2336. Uh, pandemic unemployment assistance, 519. 
pandemic emergency unemployment claims, 644. Those numbers are all popping up again. Total regular claims since March 16th, uh, again, 63,929, and then 9,023 and 9,738, respectively, on those fronts. Uh, next topic is uh, uh, CARE 19, and CARE 19 now searchable. Again, I said this yesterday, Google Play Store for Android users. Uh, and again, if you can... Uh, we encourage you to do your part to help us slow the spread uh, by uh, by downloading. Uh, remember to enable location service services in there. There's now 27,500 total users. That's about 4% of the North Dakota population. But of course, we need uh, even the more we have, the more effective this will be. And again, it's com your privacy is completely protected. So thank you if you're already a, a user either on iPhone or Android. Uh, next up uh, is our behavioral health update, and today's topic is suicide prevention for veterans. And uh, supporting your and others' mental health is important, and learning about suicide prevention can make the difference in the life of you or someone you love. Uh, one of the tragic statistics that I learned uh, after becoming governor, when we've got brave uh, soldiers uh, serving uh, in the military, uh, in the regular military, our North Dakota National Guardsmen have all been deployed continuously uh, in the war on terrorism since the USS Cole. So that's before 9-11, we've had the longest continuous deployment of North Dakota Guard soldiers. And of course, some of those who've bravely served in combat zones uh, have given the ultimate sacrifice. But the statistic which is shattering is that over the course of the last uh, 20 years, uh, we've lost more uh, North Dakota uh, soldiers to suicide than we have to combat. And that's why it's important for us to think about suicide prevention and making a difference uh, in the life of someone that you may love. North Dakota's Department of Veterans Affairs Commissioner Lonnie Wagon has issued a challenge to all North Dakotans to take the S-A-V-E training, or the SAVE training, and become an advocate and a resource for those struggling uh, with their mental health. The challenge only takes two steps in, a t in 25 minutes, and in that time you can equip yourself with the tools to get someone the help they need and maybe save a life. We've got up on the list here, the first step is, is a simple one, add the crisis hotline contact information on this slide uh, to your phone so you're prepared to help. And again, if, you, uh, if, if this slide passes too quickly, uh, 1-800-273-8255. There's even a, a selection after that. You can press one for veterans, or you can text 838255 to chat, and that's, again, confidentially. And then there's also instant message to the veteranscrisisline.net or chat. Uh, that's step one, is just make sure you've got those phone numbers handy and can get people in contact with them or call yourself if you need to visit with someone. The second step from Lonnie uh, is to register and take the 23 minute online training, visit the Veterans Affairs website, nd.gov slash veterans, click on the commissioner's challenge in the top ribbon. Uh, the video that you'll see, the 23 minute online training is designed to empower viewers with the basic knowledge of what signs uh, may be for someone who is struggling with thoughts of suicide, provides ideas on how to help. And while the video does refer to veterans specifically, the principles are universal and everyone can benefit from the shared knowledge. knowledge. We can all take the commissioner's challenge and I challenge you to take the commissioner's challenge to prevent suicide. To learn more, to take the challenge, visit the North Dakota Department of Veteran Affairs website at nd.gov slash veterans. In uh, closing, uh, for today's uh, prepared portion, we want to say, uh, again, our gratitude section. This goes out to uh, Make-A-Wish North Dakota and the many medical providers, volunteers, and donors who for the last 35 years have granted 950 wishes to children battling critical illness. Perhaps most importantly, we want to recognize those children and their families whose strength, hope, and perseverance is an inspiration to us all. Today is World Wish Day in North Dakota. 
a day to celebrate hope and to recognize that many children and families are battling critical illnesses. Uh, during the ongoing COVID-19 emergency, make a wishes postponed most wishes to protect the health and safety of wish children who are already medically compromised, as well as the health and safety of volunteers and, su and supporters. And while these incredible children wait for their wish to come true uh, during this pandemic, Make-A-Wish is asking you to share a message of a hope on your social media channel using the hashtags, uh, hashtag wishes are waiting and be sure to tag at Make-A-Wish ND. And so that's, uh, that's our Make-A-Wish. That's kind of our good news, gratitude piece. Uh, and again, hope like gratitude grows when shared. And so thank you to Make-A-Wish for giving hope to all of these children. I also want to say, also as part of the gratitude section, I want to say uh, thank you to all of our uh, farmers and ranchers in North Dakota. We know that that uh, with the COVID crisis hitting a uh, number of processing plants across America, that there is going to be, this is driving beef prices down. So if you've got a cow-calf operation in North Dakota, we know that you're facing tough times. As farmers are getting out, scratch a little bit dirt in the West. We know those that in the East are still facing very wet fields. We know that we've got folks, and we've been in contact with legislators uh, from around uh, James River Valley area. We know there's a lot of flooding that's still occurring locally there in some townships and covering roads. But again, our uh, we know we want those that are dealing with multiple challenges, uh, whether it's uh, economic or whether it's weather or whether it's spring flooding. Uh, they're dealing with that the same time that we're dealing with the virus. We want to make sure that you know that uh, we're thinking of you uh, and we continue to want to deploy resources to help support you as well. So thank you for, for everything you're doing uh, to stay safe uh, during these challenging times. In closing, I want to say a, a quote uh, from Victor Hugo. Of course, he's the author that you know that wrote uh, La Miserable and also Hunchback of Notre Dame. But he said, in, in joined hands, there is hope. In a clenched fish, there is none. And again, uh, we want to say thanks to all the people that are out there uh, joining hands, uh, but not literally joining hands because we're keeping physical distance, uh, but they're doing that in a way where they're supporting their neighbors and helping people, whether it's uh, someone who's got a flooding issue next door or whether it's a child with cancer. We know that every day there's remarkable things happening by North Dakotans, and we say thank you to all of you. And with that, we'll stand for questions. Okay. Okay, we've got some new news back on uh, on uh, unemployment update. So this will pretend this was the first question. Can you please update us on what's happening with unemployment assistance? Uh, last night, Job Service successfully implemented the software coding on our aging mainframe. Uh, for the PUA program made the initial payments of benefits to individuals today. There was 3,532 weeks of benefits were paid for a total of $2.5 million. These are to self-employed workers uh, via the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Assistance Program. This is a brand new program that was just created earlier this month by federal legislation and there was no systems in the country to support this. So thanks again to our team that made all the changes, software changes to uh, to get this and make this possible. An additional 1,500 of these self-employed workers uh, checks are gonna be processed tonight for payment tomorrow. Uh, the remaining applications currently on file either require follow-up information or will be moved to a state unemployment insurance claim due to federal regulations. This, to speed the PUA benefits to individuals, the, the PUA minimum of 228 per week along with the 600 per FPUC payment was paid to each applicant for each week on their application, which includes the back weeks. As TAC information can be processed, uh, job service will rec recalculate each individual's weekly benefit benefit amount and will pay additional amounts owed to the individual at that time. This is consistent with the process used by other states that are striving to get as much needed payments into the hands of individuals as possible. And although any wait for benefits is frustrating, again, I want to say thank so much to our job service team member uh, whose hard work appears to have made North Dakota one of the first 10 states to both accept and pay the PUA benefits. And again, with this new legislation, there wasn't any state in the nation that had 
had uh, software systems to be able to make these payments. So thanks for working around the clock, North Dakota Job Service. They have now handled more than three years uh, worth of claims in just six weeks. Uh, and again, thanks to all those folks and everybody who's working on the hotlines. With now, we'll stand for questions. Go ahead, Jeremy, and then online. Just a follow up from yesterday, uh, and perhaps I missed something here, but I, I believe you said there would be some more guidance for movie theaters looking to open on Friday. I'm wondering if you have that at this point. I did include that. I had a slide up, and uh, maybe you were doing double duty because I know they're having you do photography uh, as well. Uh, or maybe I actually pissed o maybe I passed over that in this, this uh, thing, and I will, because I know we had a slide, and maybe I didn't say it. Did I pass over it, Mark? I did pass over it. I was so so excited to get to the next topic. I'm looking for it right now, so I don't have to do it from memory, but I think I have most of it in my head. Um, and where would that be? Anybody got a guess? Page five or right there. Can, or you can read the slide, uh, okay, which is, uh, it. we worked with the movie theater I don't want to say that they have an association, but owners of movie theaters, because uh, even I was surprised a little bit when I saw the draft that said they were limited to 20% of normal operating capacity for each auditorium. Uh, but th this is a place where they'd like to start. It allows for proper spacing. And it was explained to me that if you're going to close every other, uh, every other row, uh, right away you're down to 50%. Then if you got six feet between people, I think they did the math and said if we're going to have every other row and six feet in between, you'll probably end up at about 20%. So they'll limit the sales. Uh, on this in terms of that uh, and that'll essentially the key thing here is allowing for proper spacing uh, waiting areas and, op and things they'll stagger start times uh, encourage timely arrival to limit uh, congestion uh, implement new safety guidelines regarding food service so I'm sure that you're going to see gloved and masked people uh, serving popcorn but I would uh, say there's going to have they're going to have some good rules and again it's all voluntary but movie theaters can open up this Friday across the state of North Dakota if they they choose to and and I would say if you're uh, interested in going go the first night on Friday night because those theaters will be really clean no one's been in them for a couple months so okay thanks for catching that Jeremy I missed that when I went through there 660 KYZ in Williston how long do you expect North Dakota to be in phase one of our restart and what will you and your team be looking for to move on to phase two uh, for Mike, I don't have any expectations because I, uh, in this dealing with something with this much uncertainty, having an expectation probably could either uh, lead to making a decision with too much emotion or could lead to uh, to uh, disappointment. So again, we're just going to keep tracking the tracking the numbers. It's, it's going to take us a while when we have this. We talked about turning the dial, the dimmer switch up again as we start to increase more interaction back into the economy. As we, as, as as the high contact businesses, I say the personal care and the bars, restaurants, movie theaters, that high, and gyms opening up, that high, those high contact moments. The way the transmission occurs, if transmission is occurring as it did earlier uh, in in a gym setting in North Dakota at the very beginning of this. We may not know that for a week or two. So again, we have to, when you reset the dial, then you've got to go for a week or two at the new level to really understand whether or not you're seeing an increase in the numbers or not, and then seeing whether our commensurate capacity to deal with it is going up. So I would, I guess I would, if I guess I am setting a little bit of expectations, but given the 14 day kind of incubation cycle on this virus, I, I think it's very hard to move faster than, than uh, the fastest you could possibly move is kind of two-week cycles because that's you would take that long to find out uh, whether you're having a good result or bad result with the relaxation. And that's, again, I'd go back to appealing to individual responsibility. I know everybody universally wants things open. If you, it's, sort of, it's sort of an inverse. The more open you want it to be, the sooner, the more important that we keep practicing all the North Dakota smart hygiene and distancing guidelines. The better we perform, the sooner we can uh, have everybody have our economy rolling again. Okay, Dave? This is for Chris Jones. Hey. Way to go, Dave, thank you for. Here comes the birthday gentleman. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask how old you are, but I think you're past boy, right? You're the birthday man. No. Physically. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned about people in assisted living centers and nursing homes. What about for people like visiting angels? Are there special things for 
people who visit people in and give caregivers in house in in the dwelling. So just visiting it, that's a um, home and community based service. Um, that they still need to follow the same precautions that we've had. We we y there is a little bit of a difference there because those individuals are sitting in a, a single housing setting. They're in in some ways socially isolated, which puts them at risk as well. Um, so we do need to be able to continue to send workers out there, um, and those workers are following the PPE recommendations and, and the sanitation and, and those type of things. So that they are not impacted by this. Required to wear a mask or? Anything? Yes. So um, they're, they're wearing masks. Most of the home and community-based services, whether it be, I can't remember the, the firm you said, but um, they are visiting angels. They are, they are making phone calls first to understand the situation before they go in. And then based on the screening questions they ask before that, that will then dictate what type of PPE they will bring with them. And oftentimes they will still bring their own just out of an abundance of caution. I'm um, wondering uh, if so far, if anyone has been transferred under the new transfer protocols yet. I'm, no, I'm doing a quick, uh, HIPAA law review in my head. Um, should be okay, right, Leslie? Yes, there, there has been. I'll just leave it at that. Yes, there has been. And, uh, when it comes to those transfer protocols, is it more a question of the capabilities of the place they are in or the condition of the person? It's all of the above, and, it, and it's even more. And so that's the reason we really want to be have a partnership between the providers, whether that be a skilled nursing or other congregate housing setting, the hospital, um, the other nursing homes around there, if we're talking about a nursing home resident, and then understanding where that, if that, if that nursing home can manage it, or that congregate housing can manage it, we need to be there and, and multi multiple times verify that they can manage it. We're not gonna just trust that they can manage it. And then, because there, there are other implications when you do transfer. So it's, we are trying to take the rights of the individual in that congregate housing setting into consideration, as well as the rights of the other individuals who are living in that congregate setting and weighing the risks of transfer against the ability to quarantine and cohort within that congregate housing setting. So there's not a, while we do have a very objective algorithm as it relates to transfers in and out, it still has to be a decision based on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I have a, just a definition that I'd like to ask here. Um, when you were talking about the homeless population, I think you mentioned scattered housing. I was just wondering if you could define that for us. Uh, scattered housing just means that we are putting them in, um, we are providing site settings that allow them to be quarantined by themselves. So, there could be multiple different types of situations. But we want to be able to isolate them, non-group. We want to... Is that for everybody or just for... For the COVID body? positives. Because, because, again, we don't want to put COVID positive individuals who are experiencing homelessness into a shelter and then have the entire shelter become infected. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll go uh, back online and then Lane. Eric Arndt, KZZY in Devil's Lake. With North Dakota Smart Restart happening on Friday, what is the timeline for reopening Capitol Building and other state facilities for tours or business as well as uh, state historic sites? I uh, no, have no announcements to make on that today, Eric, but uh, we do have a team uh, called the Continuity of Government Team that meets three times a week that's reviewing all of this, of course, we have tried to keep providing almost all, almost every aspect of government while we've been working remotely. And so again, like uh, schools, there's right now no economic hardship associated with uh, government buildings being closed. We want to uh, provide, provide those services and reduce the amount of transmissible contact time. And so we'll, again, that'll be one of the dials that we dial up, but right now no announcements on that yet. 
Uh, we're not deaf. I know that I do know that some uh, cities are thinking about reopening some limited capability next week, but that's not the plan for the state of North Dakota. We'll continue to do the uh, uh, remote working uh, for the time being. Lane. Governor, you've already said that there's not enough law enforcement in the state to post up at each and every business across the state. But if a business feels like they're being overwhelmed with so many people coming out this weekend, are they able to call law enforcement to come disband that or does that fall onto the business? Well, I think again, this is a, uh, I'm gonna leave this to the good judgment of North Dakota business owners and uh, local enforcement because uh, it's an absolute accuracy that we do not have the capability uh, or probably even the interest to try to manage that at, at a state level. Uh, this has really got to be people using their own judgment. It can go from anywhere from someone deciding uh, that they they don't want to open. They can. It's all voluntary if you want to open this weekend. If you do open uh, and you find you've got a crowd that is exceeding uh, the guidelines, uh, then probably need to think about uh, again, how are you protecting your employees and how are you protecting your business longer term? Because it's not about you know how many customers you can get on the first day. It's you know how can you learn to operate under this under the this situation in a way where you can sustain your business and not have an outbreak at your location. And the, and the more people you have, the more crowded you get. Uh, the, you're increasing the pos possible transmission risk for your customers. And I would just think again, good judgment would uh, indicate that people would want to follow these guidelines to protect themselves, their team members, their customers. So we'll and I. I think that'll happen and and like I said 99% of the cases that'll happen will there be a new story or two about you know beautiful weekend and some crowd that shows up on place I'm sure there will be I'm sure we'll be able to find that in a state our size but uh, that'll be that'll be far and away the exception not the rule because we just have a lot of people in our state that have great judgment Jeremy and then Dave this is a quick one uh, I just have a process question I guess um, you, you said that you'd like to stay away from doing another statewide closure order in the future, but you might do targeted orders for certain workplaces. Would those come from the state health officer or would those come from you? Uh, they would, uh, if, it, if it has to do with quarantine, like it does with a plant closure or something like that, would be the state health officer. Would there ever be like a, a mandatory closure order for an employer? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that there would be because again, I, I think the incentive for employers is they you can't you can't run your business if you don't have employees if employees are at risk you want to protect them uh, and so in the cases so far we've you know whether it's uh, large plants or small companies the employers generally are right there saying hey let's close the place let's clean it let's do what we have to do because they're they're trying to figure out uh, that for the for the long term and, and if I didn't cover this on the, the closures, I want to make sure I hit this one again because uh, there has been some uh, discussion. But the, uh, the executive order uh, that, we're, that we were talking about, uh, which was, you know, 2020.06.3, that one is set to expire at midnight on Thursday night. Uh, the new one takes uh, the 2020.06.4 takes uh, effect at 12 a.m. So if Effectively, they bump right up against each other with no gap. In the one that takes effect, it says that, that you can open your businesses using the guidelines at or after 8 a.m. on Friday morning. Uh, and I'm just saying this because I know we've seen that there were some, uh, some folks on Facebook that were planning to have big parties on Thursday night at midnight. I mean, we've got some cities that the bars are open till 2 a.m. Uh, and the intention of this is very explicitly says, uh, we said May 1st, that means... Uh, through this executive order, 8 a.m. on May 1st, not midnight on May 1st. Uh, we're not trying to be, uh, uh, not, we're not trying to uh, set a, uh, a North, North Dakota Smart Restart would not include midnight binge drinking before closing time. So we're trying to avoid that. <clears throat> I guess you can do that at home on, if you really want to do that on Thursday night. But we're at 8 a.m. on Friday morning. <clears throat> and for anybody whose birthday was, is May 1st. We're also thinking of them too by not opening till 8 a.m. If you're turning 21 on on May 1st, on Happy May Day, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. is when you can uh, start gearing up to reopen under the new guidelines. Other questions? We got Jeremy and then Dave. Or, no, did I just do you? Yeah. Okay, Dave, your turn. I cannot remember. You did issue an order closing state campgrounds, correct? Uh, yes. Thinking about opening them up anytime soon. 
yeah, we're thinking, certainly thinking about that, and the uh, the team uh, at Parks and Rec is again trying to figure out how do we do that and how do we do that uh, safely. Uh, and I think, uh, again, uh, as we we know in these in our North Dakota Parks and Rec, that's really a in the summertime it's a hospitality business. I think you know over 100,000 visitor night stays. It's like running a, it's like running 13 hotels. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, whether the campground facilities, the public restrooms, uh, that we got the right spacing, got the right hygiene. A lot of that depends on summer staff, and so we may think about this as as a. a a delayed summer opening or a spring opening, but I know that there is uh, a desire, of course, if, if, if at all possible, we'd love to have them open before Memorial Day weekend, uh, even if it's under uh, restricted access but uh, or sooner than that. But anyway, those are some things that we're definitely looking at. And we'll, we'll and I just make a note to our team that we'll provide an update on on uh, campgrounds at a future state, state park specifically, uh, cities, county campgrounds, uh, will probably include some guidance for them as well, or they may be, a lot of people are so collaborative, they're just calling and saying, what are you doing? But we'll try to make sure that people know what we're doing at North Dakota Parks and Rec. Okay, you're going back online. Joe Bowen, Grand Forks Herald. My understanding is that workers can't continue to collect unemployment benefits if their employer makes an offer for them to come back to work. However, many businesses are giving people the option to return to work if they feel comfortable. Uh, is there a functional difference between those two scenarios? And if, somebody, if someone's employer gives them the option to return, can that person continue to collect unemployment? Uh, excellent question with a lot of nuance. Uh, and if I were an employment lawyer, I probably would still uh, give a qualified answer. So I, will, uh, I would say that's probably a good question for our unemployment insurance team. I think that because it's the, the depth of the question is on the nuance, because if you have an opportunity to go to work and your employer wants you back, uh, then and you uh, decline that, then the way the rules are written, you're not eligible for for unemployment at that point because you've had a chance to go to work and you didn't take it. So I know that part is very clear. Uh, but in the middle of that question, there was a nuance about uh, if the employer is giving you a choice on whether you come back or not. So I don't know if that would qualify as an actual offer to come back or not. That's where we'd have to get get real clear real clear on what it is. But uh, I think again, uh, we would ask uh, both individuals and employers to understand that this is if you've. Uh, and you know, from a principled standpoint, from an ethics standpoint, people shouldn't be double dipping, you shouldn't have a job and be drawing unemployment insurance. And if you have a job and are able to work, uh, then we would hope that the majority of North Codans who understand the value and the joy of work would work uh, and, uh, and, and again, help preserve the dollars for those that truly don't have an opportunity to work because uh, that's, that's meant to be a backstop system. It's not, uh, getting an unemployment check is not a replacement for the the value of actually working. Jeremy. Um, so today the State Board and Higher State Board of Higher Ed and the, the university system started moving forward on reopening campuses this fall. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that decision and if you think they acted at the right time. Yeah, I had a had a nice conversation or a productive conversation with the Chancellor Hagerot and uh, Chairman Hacker from the State Board of Higher Education the other night, along with some folks from the governor's office and and Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford, and we're in full support of their decision. Uh, if you are uh, Purdue University, others around the nation uh, had also this week indicated that they were going to be accepting applications for fall enrollment on campus. And this is the time when seniors are making decisions and people are deciding whether they're going to come back. And I think in the, uh, the right decision is to get out there and say, yes, uh, we're going to be open and we're going to do it on campus. Between now and then, uh, if the virus is still going, there may be uh, you know, changes that are made in terms of distancing and classroom spacing and, uh, you know, people that are on campus, but you could have people on campus doing a mix of online and in person while they're on the campus to maintain some of that spacing. So their, their business models will continue to change. But I think that again, given the, the population of the typical age of a college student is at less risk, I think it's a, a smart way uh, to signal that we're going to try to figure out a way to add uh, um, at least at a minimum, a mix of in-person and, and online heading into next fall. And of course, that can all be subject to change. They thought they're gonna do school for the whole year and that spring break they had to say, we're done because the virus, if it comes back strong next winter, uh, you know, 
everybody, we might be back in the same boat where we are, uh, but if we are, we'll be, we won't be in the same boat because we'll have built a bigger, stronger boat with all the skills and tools and testing and contact tracing and quarantine that we have. So we'll be, we, you know, we're, we were kind of in, uh, we were in the, you know, we were like in a bad Indiana Jones movie. We're, you know, on a log riding through some whitewater and, uh, you know, maybe next year if it come back, we'll be on a nice boat that we built that we can sail through the storm together better. Online, and then Dave, and then we're done. I keep thinking Mike's going to ask a question when he raises his hand, but I'm, I'm like, come on, give me a break, Mike. Uh, no, okay, Danny, online. Chris Larson, Flag Family Media. In a previous conference this week, you had mentioned you had mentioned guidelines for churches. Do you have any further guidance? Uh, don't have any further guidance. Churches were always able to be open. We deeply respect uh, those that sought to protect their congregations by choosing to go to online or other methods of serving the spiritual needs of their congregation as they as some may choose to voluntarily reopen this weekend, some may choose to keep going with the online. Uh, if they do open, uh, we would hope that they would follow the guidelines that we talked about for under all businesses, because uh, all businesses, meaning all industries, including nonprofits, which is again, you know, the, the list that we had up of the nine, the nine lists that are on the guidelines, they're part of the executive order, uh, but we would in, in certainly encourage all churches to follow those. Uh, it would be close every other pew, uh, family can sit together, but strangers not eliminate uh, the passing of of the offering physical offering plates that people might be touching a common surface. Uh, maybe having uh, people, you know, at door greeters that are actually opening doors so the congregation don't all have to touch the same door handle. Uh, you know, encouraging people that are vulnerable, uh, under you know, either age or underlying health to attend virtually as opposed to in person. So a lot of common sense COVID etiquette rules. Uh, and I think that uh, we'll see some churches reopen in a smart way. Others may choose to just stay online. We'll see. Dave? I'm just curious, of, as we're heading into what is normally a, a big travel season, have you thought any more, more about the travel restrictions that you have for people coming back to North Dakota or, or flying back or driving back? Well, we're, we're keeping the... For now, the travel uh, restrictions, if you're flying back from those hotspot areas, those remain in place. Uh, we did have a discussion today uh, as <clears throat> other, uh, you know, South Dakota always remained open. They did not have a shelter in place, stay at home. Uh, again, we're fortunate Montana and Wyoming uh, are among the states of the the, among the four that have lower per positive rates than we do. So we've got a great neighborhood uh, here to speak of. And I think, you know, Minnesota is starting to loosen up a few things. Uh, I, there may be a possible that you might see a regional lifting where we might say that if you're coming from the neighboring neighboring states or parts of neighboring states, because you could even say, uh, you know, have different rules uh, if, if somebody's, you know, been in... Uh, uh, an adjacent county versus if you're down in the Twin Cities, for example, we could think about those differently. Uh, but we we want to you know just think about how do we how do we start making it easy for people to move within our region. Uh, the virus doesn't understand the state borders, uh, and so we have to always take that in mind. Uh, but uh, but again, for right now, if people are returning from these hotspot areas, New York, Michigan, Louisiana, uh, those other states, uh, the the 14 day self isolation check in on the North Dakota Health website when you return to North Dakota, and be North Dakota smart. So with that, uh, we'll again say uh, thank you all for being here. We'll see you tomorrow at 3:30. Uh, Appreciate all the questions. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, it's a beautiful day in North Dakota, and uh, we are there's. Uh, <clears throat> It's free uh, and it's available and it's right now, it's called the outdoors. Uh, so get out, go for a walk, uh, enjoy our beautiful state and, uh, and uh, have a little bit of wonder about the amazing nature that we're surrounded by. Thank you, North Dakota.